is episode 40 of Changes, Conversations Between Authors. I'm Sally Ember, EDD, and right here in St. Louis, in my Changes studio, is Mario Casa, one of my favorite people in the world. Today is September 2nd, 2015, and we are honored to have you as our guest. Mario, tell us about you. Well, uh, I live in Bali, on the island of Bali in Indonesia, for nine months of the year, and I come to America for three months of the year, and I'm happy to be visiting with you in St. Louis. St. Louis Louis, it's so exciting. So some of you who maybe didn't know that we were gonna have this St. Louis rendezvous are wondering why I kept saying, meet me in St. Louis Louis on our promos, and this is the reason. And a friend of mine who I thought was really gonna be able to be here for this show just announced she can't be here. Sorry, Melita. Bye, I hope you can watch it later. Melita Noel Cantu is the um, chairperson, director, creator of Censored to Celebrated, which some of you heard me talk about previously, did a whole tour of the Northeast of the United States and Eastern Canada, giving away books to libraries, children's books and teenage books about diversity, especially related to gender and sexual orientation, which is an awesome thing to do. And she says I inspired her to do it. I think she's just very creative. Anyway, thank you, Mario, for being here. Tell us a little bit about what you do in Bali and what you've been doing and why you wanted to come on my show. Well, I wanted to come on your show to be with you. Oh, um, you're so sweet. But um, what I do in Bali, I've been living in Bali on and off for the past three years and have been in the process of forming a business in Indonesia, which is uh, an entirely different kind of experience from forming a business in America. Although I keep telling myself if an Indonesian were to form a business in America, they would have to go through all the kinds of stuff that I've had to go through as an American forming a business in Indonesia. Okay, time out. Mario Casa is one of the most diplomatic, tactful people I've <laughs> ever met. And in contrast, people sometimes have called me tact-free. So you will notice that he <laughs> is very careful about what he says. Go on. Well, it's true. Um, so I have this business that I thought was going to be called Motivational Arts Unlimited. <clears throat> and I like that name because the initials M-A-U spell the Indonesian word for want or desire. And after uh, applying for the, the business registration, after being told by my lawyer that the name had been approved, when the name, when the business was finally registered in May, they named it Motivational Arts Consultants, mm. which is MAC. Which does that is, mean? Well, it doesn't mean anything in Indonesia. Oh. So what we've done to get around that is we're still using the name Motivational Arts Unlimited, the programs of PT Motivational Arts Consultants. So the name that we've given to our programs is Motivational Arts Unlimited because it speaks to our philosophy, which is that the arts can motivate and uh, help heal and help people move forward in their lives, and that the possibilities are unlimited. So let me just tell all of you, we were practicing, rehearsing, talking through what we might do for today, last night, and I ended up crying like four times. And I just said, we can't do this. We can't get me on the air and have me be crying because this man is an incredible therapist. And one of the things he does that's amazing is psychodrama, which maybe you don't know what that is, so I'm gonna let you tell people what that is. But the basic premise behind it, as I understand it, is it gets people into an alternate or surplus reality, as it's called, to experience things more fully and directly sometimes than we allow ourselves to experience them in regular life. So tell us more about why you're a psychodramatist and how that works for you. Well, psychodrama, a lot of people, when they hear the words, if they don't know what it means, their first thought is Alfred Hitchcock. And uh, also, very often, theater critics or uh, movie critics will use the word psychodrama in a very inappropriate way. Psychodrama, J. L. Moreno was the creator and founder of psychodrama, and he took it from the Greek word psyche and drama, which means the soul or essence in action. So his theory was that uh, we have enough opportunities in our day-to-day -day reality to encounter both positive and negative experiences 
And from the negative experiences, we can sometimes get stuck or hurt. And that we needed to have another place, which he called surplus reality, in which we could correct the things that didn't go right the first time for us. So psychodrama is the opportunity to take the things that we've internalized that we're holding on to, the hurts or even the positive experiences that we haven't filed really correctly and put them out where we can look at them. We usually do psychodrama with a group. Uh, even if we do it with individuals, we do it in action, possibly on the stage or in the playing space. And then we can look at them and say, oh, okay, I see that, you know, I don't have to keep hold of that anymore. That's part of the past. That's not the present. And the really interesting thing is that Moreno started developing psychodrama in the 1920s. And in the last 10 or 15 years, with the opportunity to do PET scans and CAT scans and the various kinds of brain imaging, that we've been able to demonstrate that the kind of work that's done using expressive modalities actually has an effect on the parts of the brain that store information. And that when we experience traumatic or upsetting events, information gets misstored. And that the part of the brain that gets re-stimulated when we have a, um, a memory of something bad can't tell the difference between the present and the past. And so when we get... So in, wait a minute. Yes. So that's what some people call getting triggered. Right. Getting in triggered. other vernacular. Or, and, and before you go on, I just want to acknowledge that one of our former acting out students has visited for a minute, calls herself Honey Ann now, but we knew her as Heather. And she says, unfortunately, she's at work and she can't stay, but she wanted to say hi to you, Mario, whom she hasn't seen in many years and hugs to us both. Hi, honey. Hi, honey. Thanks for coming by. We hope you get to watch it later. So you were going to go on and explain. Right. So I was saying that um, that part of the brain, it's called the amygdala. I really like that word. The amygdala can't tell time. So when the amygdala gets triggered, many people have heard of post-traumatic stress disorder and flashbacks. When the amygdala gets triggered, it doesn't know that there's a memory happening. It feels like it's happening again. Oh, like now. Right. Everything is now. Right. Or sometimes I might be having a, an interaction with someone in my current life and the emotional response to it is greater than what's really going on. Mm -hmm. It's because there's something about that memory that's triggering a past memory that was really much more severe. So it happens a lot with grief. Yes, with grief, with loss, with trauma. And so psychodrama uh, has been shown to be a way to really help move the memories around so that I get to the point where I can say, oh, wait a minute. That's an old memory. It's an unpleasant memory. It was something bad. It was something that shouldn't have happened that did, uh, that I had no control over. But it's not something that's happening now. And when I start to feel that, I can, I can, um, there's ways I can bring myself back into the present. Because the part of my brain that has executive functioning, the prefrontal cortex, is stronger than the amygdala when it has adequate information. So what you're talking about in very simple terms is we have the capacity, if someone trained is helping us go through this process, to heal old hurts and traumas, even if it seems as if it's hopeless. It's not hopeless. Right. And I really need to acknowledge and appreciate uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Kate Hudgens, and, Hi, Kate. The, and the therapeutic spiral model, which she developed over many years with the uh, collaboration of many people, myself included, for using psychodrama safely with survivors of trauma. And it's through the work that I've done with the therapeutic spiral that I really became, became aware of how to utilize psychodrama appropriately, both with survivors of trauma, but also uh, one of my specialties is working with adolescents. And uh, adolescents is intrinsically uh, a time during which the amygdala has increased affect. The amygdala actually swells during adolescence. So and we're so, more emotional. Right. So adolescents, 
you know, people say, oh, you're being so dramatic. Well, adolescents are supposed to be more dramatic because their amygdalas are trying to learn by experience the, uh, the various shades of feeling. So everything is terrible or wonderful, and then they start to be able to discern, well, this is not as terrible as that, and this is not as wonderful as that. But it's through going through the extremes that the amygdala puts you through during adolescence that you learn to make those distinctions. So I want to stop out for a minute and just acknowledge a few things and spell a few things for people watching or listening without watching. We have an event page on Google+. Plus in which I have listed all of Mario's contact points and also Dr. Kate Hudgens' website and an upcoming workshop that she's doing in Charlottesville, Virginia in a couple weeks in September that is a portion of the therapeutic spiral work called the Trauma Triangle. So I hope that anyone in that area who's interested in that who can fly to that area or drive, you should go to that workshop. It's really wonderful. It's very basic. It's a good intro workshop to the therapeutic spiral. And Dr. Kate Hodges is a dynamic, wonderful leader, and I'm sure she's collected some other people around her for that workshop that are usually in psychodrama called auxiliaries, right? right? Who will be in the scene with you, but who have a lot more experience. If you decide to participate in a psychodrama scene, you'll have people around you who know what they're doing, so you won't be up there and, oh, what do I do? How do I do this? And then she'll be the director or someone else experienced will be the director. And it's very safe. It's a very safe container. I participated in dozens of psychodramas, usually with Mario or Kate as the director, sometimes with other people that Mario has trained. And I have to say, it's very powerful, very powerful work for people who have suffered in any way, in your family, in your childhood, in the current life. I would say that Kate has really pioneered it, in my understanding, with refugees and people who have suffered dramatic, traumatic events in their homes. And that could be due to weather, earthquakes, other kinds of war and terrible events that happen. And she's been able to go all around the world, is still doing that, and you did some of that with right. her, to help some of these groups that have been so dramatically impacted in a negative way to deal with those things and to heal as best they could. And I really admire that. I think that's amazing that you've Thank been doing you. that. Yes. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that I've also on the event page put covers of the books that you've written or that we co-wrote or that you've contributed to as an author and those covers and how to get those books are also all on your website and so his website information is there it is dramario.net d-r-a-m-a-r-i-o.net and dr kate hudgens is d-r-k-a-t-e-h-u-d-g-i-n-s dot org o-r-g and all of that's there, and please go to the Google event webpage anytime and see more about Mario, his bio, his explanation of all the letters after his name, everything you want to know about him is there. But now what I want you to do is a demonstration. Well, before we do the demonstration, <clears throat> I'd like to say something about what's happening in Bali. Please do. Because that's very much on, on my mind. Uh, I just left Bali a little over a week ago and uh, left the Motivational Arts Unlimited programs in the hands of my very competent business and promotions manager, Joe Prarita, uh, an Indonesian fellow who is helping to develop a pilot project for youth serving professionals who uh, might be teachers, counselors, people who do outreach work with youth to bring psychodrama and action methods to Indonesia. And we're going to be doing uh, four sessions of about three hours each, so a total of 10 hours of training for 20 youth-serving professionals. And we're going to be starting that sometime in early 2016. We're still working out the details. We have contacts in a program called Champuan College, which is a post high school program for Balinese youth that teaches English, computer skills, uh, leadership skills. And they are going to be hosting this project, but we will also be having uh, youth serving professionals from other schools and other organizations joining us. And uh, psychodrama, as Sally said, is a safe and highly effective way of working with individuals. In my experience of many years working with young people, 
I think it's one of the most important and effective ways of helping young people to, um, even uh, young people who have not experienced trauma, to meet the developmental challenges of their age. And one of the things that's true now in Bali and other parts of Indonesia is that there is a gap between the young people and the culture of their parents. Because you see young people, high school kids, walking down the street and they've all got cell phones and they're all texting. It's right They're all texting <laughs> and um, online. And there's a gap between the cultural heritage, which is very family and community or, oriented, and the kinds of influences of Western society, which is much more individualistic. And I'm really excited about how to work with the, the people serving youth in how to use action methods and psychodrama to help young people claim all the advantages of Western culture that they have the opportunity to participate in without losing track, without losing the ability to stay connected to their cultural norms. And so while you're talking, Mario, I'm going to put up on the screen for people to see an example of the kind of curriculum you're developing that is really difficult to create. And so people can see this now. It's a side-by-side -side translation. And someone is taking all of your English curriculum and making it possible for people who speak Indonesian and read Indonesian to participate. Yeah? Right, exactly. And we are going to be, all of the programs that we're going to be doing for Indonesians will be done bilingually. So I will be teaching in English. I, I, uh, Saya Bisa Bicara Bahasa Indonesia Sudikit. That means I speak Indonesian a little bit. Wow, but, but I'm impressed. Not, but not enough to teach in Indonesian. So I'll be working with an interpreter, uh, just as we, I've been working with it, several different interpreters to translate this material so that the handouts I normally give people will be in their first language rather Good. than their second language. Good. Because one of the things that's tricky Psychodrama has a lot of jargon, and there's a lot of uh, terminology, a lot of words are used that don't mean exactly what that word means when you translate it directly. <laughs> so I'm working with some very good uh, interpreters to take this material and make it in an understandable form in yes. Indonesian. You know, it's the same problem when you translate spiritual texts into another language and the original language has concepts and words that English doesn't have. And translators from Buddhist texts, say from Tibetan or from Sanskrit, have that same issue. These words don't exist in English, or if they do, they don't mean the same thing. Right. So I totally understand what you're talking about. And especially when you're giving people directions the way you do in your psychodrama workshops, like do this, it means this, understand that, they really have to get it. Right? And it can't mean the wrong thing, or they're going to physically do the wrong thing or misunderstand. Mm -hmm. So it's a really big and amazing task they're doing. Do you need any kind of help for this? Well, we do. What we're hoping to do is to offer this pilot project free of charge for these 20 teachers. And for a four session program, uh, the economy of scale is very different in Indonesia. It's going to cost, a, our expenses will come to about $2,000. So we're looking for uh, sponsors. People could sponsor one teacher for all four sessions for $100 US. Wow. Or they could sponsor one teacher for one session for $25. And we haven't set up all the web kinds of things where, that will make it simple for people to make contributions. But if you're watching and if you would like to help support this project, you can find my contact information on uh, the page that Sally told you about and send me an email and say, yeah, I'd like to help. And then we'll send you that information as soon as it's posted. And then just to make it really easy, if you don't want to go to that page because you're really busy or too lazy, you would contact Mario at M-A-R-I-O at Drumario, D-R-A-M-A-R-I-O dot net. 
and that's his email address for his professional world. And you can write him and say, I want to give money. How do I do it? And that will motivate him, motivational arts, to yeah. get that organized, which I'm going to help him do. Also. Right. Well, we also, uh, until we have dates and the whole project together, it doesn't make sense to, to start collecting for a project that hasn't been defined yet. And that's where Joe comes in. Joe is going to be setting up a Skype meeting with the folks in Indonesia uh, and uh, we'll be talking about what will be the starting dates and what day of the week and all of those kinds of things. And then uh, I think it would be really interesting if someone is going to sponsor someone to get to um, communicate with that person. Ooh. So we'll have, you know, if you sponsor a teacher, we'll give them and you're are willing to have them have your email address or your Facebook contact or whatever contact, then they can communicate with you and tell you what it is that they're they're getting from, from how the they're going to use the workshop training. Good. I think so that's, that's great. That's really I'm very excited that that and you know you said that I'm tactful, but it's not just about being tactful. One of the things that the process of becoming a business in Indonesia. The first time I went to present my business plan, I was wearing this shirt. Uh, and I was so excited because I thought I was going to be have my business plan accepted during the first presentation, and then everything would be set to go because okay. things Just so smaller. you know, because he usually gets all A's. <laughs> and they didn't accept my proposal. They wanted some revisions. And one of the things they asked for was a training outline. And I tried to explain, well, it really depends on who the participants are. And they said, well, we need to see a training outline. And that's what really got me thinking about what did I most want to do there? What did I want the first major project to be? And that's uh, when I realized that the first major project for Indonesians had to be for youth serving uh, professionals okay. and giving them training. And those are the books that you wrote and that I wrote with you are really for youth serving professionals, people yes. who work with adolescents in groups or individually. This is the book that you wrote on your own that I helped you just final edits and a few little tips. You can hold it closer to the camera. Rebels with a Cause, great title. And um, a, one of the things that my business manager is doing is he's going to be talking to an Indonesian publisher to see about having this book, the entire book, translated Excellent. into Indonesian. Because there's a lot of really good material in here that uh, we will be using in the course of the training program that rather than our having to translate and interpret little bits of it at a time to have the book available. Because Indonesia is a really big country. It, it extends over many, many miles, many kilometers, and many, many um, islands. The Indonesian is the seventh most spoken language in the globe. And to have this opportunity to start translating, interpreting, um, material of this sort into Indonesian will be important. And you also have some connections in South Korea and South Africa and some other places that are doing some translating for you of materials. Right. But this is the first time I'm hearing you might have your whole book translated. Right. That's yes. exciting. When I, I did some training in, in South Korea this past February and uh, the people who were organizing the, the training that I conducted had 60 pages of handouts translated into Korean in the booklet. And it's very exciting, even though I have no idea what any of it is because... You don't speak Korean or read it. <laughs> uh, right, that uh, to, to have a booklet of, of things that I've written translated into yeah, It's a Korean. great leap of faith, I think, for any author or any educator, any trainer, to have a translator and to have a translation. Because you are basically giving up everything you're saying or writing to someone and you don't know how well they're rendering it in this new language because you don't know this new language. So it really is a leap of faith and you're hoping and praying and trusting that this person's going to do the very best they can or the committee is doing it with all of their great intentions. But there can still be some very funny and interesting mistakes that you hope you'll find and correct 
but you might not. So mm -hmm. just to prepare you, because I know this happens in our Buddhist community where something will get translated and then everybody reads it or hears it and says, what? And it's just like the way the old scanning um, documents used to work where it would come up with these weird mistakes in the scanning process that weren't the word that was actually on the page at all. The words were just garbled. Or, my favorite, the way it rewrites our text. When we're trying to text someone, the autocorrect that gives right. us a totally different right. message than we intended. So we have to have a lot of grace, a lot of humor, a lot of gratitude and spaciousness in these projects. Right. Because you just don't know and you just trust they'll do their best. Now, show them the book we wrote together with two of our students. Jennifer Russell Hazelwood and Lauren Lauren Glass Grover. See, I let you talk. And this is called Acting Out the Workbook. Read the subtitle, please. Uh, a guide to the development and presentation of issue-oriented audience interactive improvisational theater. This is available on Kindle as well as in paperback form. And you can get it on Amazon. It's available through Mario's or my name. Mario Casa, C-O-S-S-A, is an author on Amazon, as I am, Sally Amber, E-M-B-E-R. So you'll see it on both of our pages. I don't think Jen and Lauren have written any other books, so you can't find them there. But they may someday. You never know. And the other thing I wanted to mention is we are going to do a demonstration right yes. now. Right now we'll do a demonstration. So tell me what kind of demonstration we're doing. Well, one of the things uh, about psychodrama is that people, um, one of my trainers from years ago, Guy Taylor, talked about competency-based psychodrama, that you can't just throw people into psychodrama and say, okay, do it, because it takes a comfort with the modality. It takes um, being able to move from left brain talking into left brain, right brain integrated action. And so one of the things that we often do is we work with images, particularly with adolescents who are not always able to articulate what they're feeling, but can pick a picture from a, a set of cards. Now, one of the, the things that I am excited about my life in Bali is that I created a deck of cards based on images of Balinese and Javanese masks and statues. And uh, Sally is finding that for us now, a picture of some of the, the pictures that are used in this deck of cards. Here they are. Are you posting them now? Yes, people should be able to see this right now on the screen. Uh, and there are 60 images. They are available through a distributor in China. We're becoming very international. And the way these cards might be used, there's a, a number of images. You can see some of them are pleasant, some of them are frightening. Uh, we're going to do this demonstration, and Sally is going to be a 15-year-old teenage girl named Wanda. And for those of you who remember the Doogie Hauser program. Uh, I, when I first created the Acting Out program uh, back in 1989, Doogie Hauser had just come on TV, and that was one of my favorite programs. And Doogie's girlfriend was Wanda, so I use her name often. And for those of you too young <coughs> to remember that or who didn't watch it, that was Neil Patrick Harris's debut on television as a star, and look at him now. When he was 16. He was really a kid. And he played a doctor, a right. full-blown doctor at 16. So that was very cool. Boy, genius. So uh, in this little demonstration, we're going to assume that Wanda has agreed to be uh, the protagonist, the person who's going to be doing the work in a group. And that earlier, as part of the group experience, she's picked two cards. And rather than confuse you, we're using blank cards. Uh, but on each of these cards, there's an image. And one of them represents Wanda when she feels she's really in charge of things, and one Wanda when she's struggling a bit. And so we usually begin with the card of the uh, Wanda who's on top of her game. So if you would assume the role of 15-year-old Wanda. Well, sometimes I like to just assume a different posture when I'm being a different part of me or a different character or role. So, okay. 15-year-old Wanda. 
Got her. Okay. So Wanda, this is the image that you chose for when you're really on top of your game. So uh, rather than tell us about this image, I'd like you to speak as if you are the image. So hold the card up where the members of the group can see it. And you're going to, what could, what could we call this, this part of Wanda who's really in charge? Well, the picture is of somebody holding a baseball bat. And I'm going to pretend it's a softball bat because I play softball. Okay. And so this person is up at bat. They're right at home plate. They're ready to hit the ball. And so I'm going to call it Wanda at bat. Okay. So Wanda at bat. Um, tell me, when, when are you most alive in, in Wanda's life? When do you show up in Wanda's life? Well, when it's my turn at bat, obviously, because then I'm standing there and I'm bent over and I have my bat and I'm really watching the ball and I'm ready and everything in me is ready and then I'm really going to hit it. And you're really focused. All your attention yeah. is focused. Eye on the ball. Are there other times other than when you're playing softball when you feel like you're really at bat and ready to go? Right, yeah, because, uh, yeah. I also play piano, and so when I'm playing, I play for the chorus, and when I'm playing for their parts, and I do all the sight reading for all the parts, and I really get it right, then I feel like I'm on it. Okay, so Wanda at bat is really a, um, let me offer some words. These aren't words that you use, but I'll see if you think that they're, if they're correct. Wanda at bat has skill. Yes. And Wanda at bat is focused. And talent, don't forget talent. Talent, okay, talented, and Wanda at bat is ready to go. Yeah, and, and I try, I try really hard. Okay, great, thank you. So now I'm going to hold this over here so you'll remember Wanda at bat because she's, she's always there. Hold it up higher. All right, he's holding that one for me. Right, and this is the one that you picked for when sometimes you're, you're struggling a bit. And what can we call this part of Wanda? Yucky. Yucky? Oh, no. Not really. Well, I don't know. Can we call it yucky? No. You could if you want. Yucky Wanda? No. Uh, mm, mm, I get in trouble a lot when I'm this one. Yeah. Uh, how about screwing up Wanda? Screwing up Wanda. Yeah. And screwing up Wanda, when do you show up in Wanda's life? What's one time that you're, you're likely to show up? I don't like it when teachers call on me and I don't have my hand up. That really makes me mad. And even if I know the answer, sometimes I won't say it because I'm mad that they called on me when I didn't volunteer. I want to choose when to talk. All right. So screwing up, Wanda, uh, it sounds like you're very strong. And it sounds like you uh, help Wanda to stay in charge. Yeah. So those are good things. Do you sometimes cause problems for Wanda, too? Well, like when the teacher is trying to call on me and I don't want to answer, sometimes I say things that only people near me, my friends, can hear, and they're laughing, and then they get in trouble for laughing. Yeah. Do you ever get in trouble with the teacher? Because Does Wanda ever get in trouble with the teacher because of the way you behave? Well, sometimes because like they call on me and I don't want to answer and I look all grumpy or something or I just give them the face, you know, not. or I'll give them deliberately the wrong answer or I just won't even say anything and they get mad. All right. So if we were in a group, we would pick someone to be Wanda at bat and we would pick someone to be screwing up Wanda and then Wanda as the protagonist, the person who's doing the work, could have a conversation with those parts of herself and she could roll reverse with the parts of herself as she just did. Oh, so like I could watch myself up you there? Could. Like you on the could. stage? Right. That would uh, be cool. Or, and you can interact with yourself. But for the moment, since we don't have a group here uh, for this demonstration, I'm going to ask you to go back to being Wanda at bat. And uh, over here is screwing up Wanda, who um, gets, who sounds like she's, uh, wa so get back into being Wanda at bat. Get that sense of Wanda at bat, okay. ready to hit and everything. Right. So sounds like uh, screwing up Wanda is also a pretty strong part of Wanda. Is there any advice that you want to give her as Wanda at bat? Can she talk to her like that? Sure. Okay, so screwing up Wanda, you just have to get up there and take your hit. And even if no one 
thinks it's your turn and you don't think it's your turn, you should just take it anyway because you might hit the ball or you might strike out, but you have to take your hit. You have to do it. All right. So that sounds like some really strong, clear advice. But what I wonder is if someone talked to screwing up Wanda and that strong the voice, would she listen or would she argue back? Well, it depends. Like, I have to give you, like, a good reason. Uh, you might hit a home run. You might do really well. You might surprise yourself. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to just say that once more as if you're talking to your best friend and you want them to hear and know that you care about them rather than uh, that you're just telling them what to do. Well, look, if you want to do well in school, you need to answer the teacher because you could get a much better grade and you could do really well and you might really like doing well instead of always being in trouble. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, as Mario and Sally, I'm gonna take Sally out of role and then we'll talk about that a little bit. So in psychodrama, when we take on the role, of our own or someone else's. We always de-roll afterwards. So Sally was just in the role of Wanda. I'm going to ask you, Sally, what's one thing about Sally that's similar to Wanda? Well, strong will and confidence and courage, those are similar. Mm -hmm. And what are three things that are different about Wanda? I'm not 15. Sally? I'm not still in high school. Those are both woohoo. Um, and I don't get to play softball anymore. But I did okay. like playing softball. Mm -hmm. All right. So take a let your feel your feet on the floor and take a, a deep breath. If your feet can reach the floor. Ha ha. Short <laughs> jokes. Welcome always. And I have to show you these socks that I'm wearing that were that a present from Sally several years ago. Made of bamboo. Very cool. And bamboo is a very important fiber in Indonesia. Do you have pandas? No. Uh, so no. who eats your bamboo? Uh, nobody will use it for baby oh. things. Pandas eat bamboo. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm so, here. So Sally, um, as someone who just did a demonstration, what would you like to say about the, the psychodramatic process of moving between the roles and giving advice from, we call this role training, and we're, what we're really doing is we're helping uh, screwing up Wanda to rewrite her job description. So what can you say from the experience of just having done it, even though this is a demonstration that wasn't you know, really a, a psychodrama that Sally was doing? Right, and it's way shorter and way faster than what you would ordinarily do right. in such a situation. But still, I felt, I felt like it had some power. And I felt like there was a lot of insight that could be extrapolated or extracted through that interaction that you were having with Wanda and each of the Wandas having with each other and that you were directing that in a way that was very helpful to get the stronger Wanda to be a little more kind to the one that needed a little help. And like that, I like that advice you gave stronger Wanda, Wanda at bat, to say something as if you were talking to a good friend because maybe she was a little bit too hard on screwed up Wanda or something and you noticed that and you wanted her to be nicer. So that's probably good because I think a lot of times, especially when we're seeing ourselves as screwing up, we might not be that nice to ourselves. So I think that's a really good point to treat ourselves like a good friend is a better way of handling that than to say, oh, just be nice. Right? So I think that you have a very good way of appealing to someone's better nature without scolding them and without making them feel badly and giving them another way to do it. Right. Normally, I would have had um, the real Wanda role reverse with screwing up Wanda and hear that advice from another group member playing the, playing the role of Wanda at bat to see if she could take it in in that way. But very often what we discover when we put somebody into what is supposed to be a positive role is that role may be contaminated with a bit of um, inner judge, inner critic, or perpetrator energy. And so we want to really decontaminate the role. And rather than make the person feel, as you said, that they did it wrong, you try to coach them to help them be at one of the things that 
that we both discovered in working with teenagers from back in the days of acting out was that even when young people, when you ask them, what's the strength you have? And they say, I don't have any strengths. With a little bit of coaching, most young people will admit that they know how to be a good friend to someone. Even if they're always getting in trouble, if they don't do well in school, they know how to be a good friend to someone else. So we're helping them learn to be a good friend to themselves. I think that's important. And I've also noticed the younger people, like I worked with a lot of times younger groups than Mario did, 11 to 13 year olds, and going into middle school and being in middle school are the really difficult years for a lot of young people. And one of the ways it's difficult is they're starting to recognize where they fit in and they don't always like what they experience in that way. And they might see themselves more negatively than they did in elementary school. Other people might treat them that way. So that is the beginning of, especially for girls, but for boys too, the development of low self-esteem and a sense of yourself of not being good enough. So I feel like this kind of work and these kinds of coaching opportunities really help heal some of that and bring back our sense of ourselves as strong and confident or a good person or able, capable. And those are really good things to bring into high school and adulthood. Right. In, in psychodrama jargon, we would call what we just did intrapsychic psychodrama, having different parts of the self. What I'd be really excited about exploring with the, the youth serving professionals in Bali is helping them to help Indonesian youth uh, have a conversation between the part of self that's still connected to the, the cultural heritage mm. and the part that's being pulled toward the Western, the excitement of the Western music and, and theater and technology mm -hmm. and to be able to have the cultural self be able to talk to the, the technological self mm. and, and keep that connection going. Because that's one of the things that drew me to, to Bali in particular, but Indonesia in general, was the rich, rich sense of community and culture in, and gratitude that people have. In Bali, the, uh, the biggest population is Hindu, but there's also a very large population of Muslims, a large population of Buddhists, a large population of Christians, both Indonesian and expats, and um, the kinds of conflict that we sometimes think about between various um, faith communities seems not to be as much happening there. You know, people, people really um, are very embracing of, of one another as people. Even though, you know, within the Hindu community, within the Balinese, they have a sense of connection to other Balinese that's different from the Javanese who live in Bali and all of that. But um, that sense of culture, whether someone is Hindu and making offering baskets every morning or Muslim <clears throat> and stopping to pray at various times of the day, uh, faith is not something that happens one day a week mm -hmm. for an hour. It's something that's part of the every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that would be a, a real disservice to the young people of Indonesia to have that kind of fall by the wayside. Mm, that's a good point. Well, I think sometimes what people do in their individuation years, which is part of the um, developmental task of adolescence, in an effort to feel themselves as an adult, they reject or push away what their own parents or grandparents represent and then later they have to decide what to pick back up, what they really do want to keep, what they didn't want to reject or push away forever. Once they've developed that sense of self, they can begin to pick and choose among all their possibilities, and you might be able to help them see the positives in some of the things that they thought they had to push away. Right. As you were saying that, I'm reminded of uh, five minutes at a, a conference that I was at many years ago listening to a panel discussion, uh, and one of the panel members was Jean Baker Miller. Oh, yes. And she said something to the effect of, you know, we've been told for many, many years that, that the task of adolescence is to individuate. 
but from uh, from my perspective, the task of adolescence is to learn to develop more mature relationship. Oh, very and good. So uh, that's what I try to work with young people about. That it's not about separating, but it's about redefining. Yes. The relationship between self and parents, between yes. self and and uh, peer, mm -hmm. between self and younger siblings, and mm -hmm. that that really allows us, rather than saying I've got to push you away, you know, I need to step back from you so I can approach you in a new way. Mm -hmm. And it's the the approaching in a new way that's the goal, not right. the separating. Well, that's really important. Daniel Goleman, who some of you may know, wrote a lot of books in, has given a lot of talks about emotional intelligence, or EQ is what it's come to be known as, and has written many books since then, is also a Buddhist. And many decades ago, he collaborated in some books with Ken Wilber and Jack Canfield and a lot of other, um, I'm sorry, Cornfield, and a lot of other very well-known Buddhist authors. And he wrote a chapter in one of the books I read called, You Have to Be Somebody Before You Can Be Nobody. Because <laughs> Buddhists talk a lot about developing a, a concept of no self. And Westerners often need a lot of therapeutic work and healing from trauma and understanding ourselves and raising our self-esteem before we're ready for Buddhism. Whereas a lot of people in other cultures don't have some of the same psychological distress that we have in the West, and they can move right into meditation and developing the no-self without any issues. So that was reminding me what you were just saying about G. Baker Miller's comment, that it's kind of both and. You have to develop your sense of self in order to have a relationship. You can't have a relationship with someone else if you don't know who you are and where you stop and the other person starts and have a good sense of boundaries. And at the same time, you don't want to have no relationships. So you can't individuate to the point of isolation because that's not mature or healthy psychologically or soci socially. So all of this balance, I think, is what you're talking about bringing to these Indonesian youth with the adults to work with mm -hmm. them through the action methods that, right. you, that you use. And now I want to go help. <laughs> <laughs> and also the other piece that Jean Bill Baker Miller talked about then is that in our Western culture, uh, maybe not as much now as it was then, this was 20 years ago, that the, the, role, the task of individuating is primarily a male task, and the task of maintaining relationship is assigned to women, and that both men and women need to learn to individuate with the purpose of reconnecting. Yes. That rather than separating out and say, you take care of the relationship, dear, and I'll be the individual, that we both need to step back and then learn how to join each other. Yes. Well, that is feminist psychology in a nutshell, is that all beings who are human are needing to achieve the same things, basically, and not to be relegated to certain opportunities and not others. So that's awesome. And guess what time it is? What time is it? It time? is past a quarter of the hour <laughs> before we have to end. And I usually at this point would be bringing in the big question that I ask everybody. Okay. And before we do that, though, I just want to know if you want to talk about upcoming workshops and things that you want people to know about that you haven't had a chance to mention yet. Well, two things that I'll mention. One is I'm very grateful to Connie Miller, the founder of Soul Drama, uh, souldrama.com and Soul Drama Asia. Dot com. That's S O U L D R A M A dot com. Uh, who invited me to participate in her seventh workshop in uh, Java this past, just a, a few weeks ago. And I'm going to be developing a psychodrama training program in Java. And you can find the Soul Drama Asia contact information on, on the event page. And also for those friends and colleagues, particularly trial lawyers and mental health professionals who live in the Bay Area of California. On November 14th, I'm going to be doing a day-long personal growth psychodrama uh, workshop in Oakland called Gratitude, focusing on connecting to our sense of gratitude and <clears throat> self-renewal and um, we're in the process of posting that information, but send me an email and I'll make sure you get the information about it. And reminding everybody again that your website and email contact 
points are on the event page, and the main website is Dramario, D-R-A-M-A-R-I-O dot net. And that November 14th is a day-long workshop on a Saturday, correct? Yes. Okay. So people who have that weekend off, it is not the weekend before Thanksgiving. So you should go. It's a really important thing to do to experience Mario as a trainer in action. It is going to be unforgettable and so valuable to you in your role working with youth, mental health, adults, or being a trial lawyer. Tell us just for a moment what that has to do with being a trial lawyer because a lot of people would be like, what? Why trial lawyers? Well, I've been working for uh, almost four years now with trial lawyers. There's a, a very well-known trial lawyer named Jerry Spence who discovered psychodrama some years ago and realized that uh, trial lawyers, first of all, get re-stimulated a lot by the work that they do. Meaning and, triggered. Right. And psychodrama is a great way for them to get in touch with their own material so they can stay more present for their clients. But also psychodrama is a great way for people to uh, role reverse with their clients to really understand the emotional core of their client's story. Mm. That's the, the short answer to it. We do a lot more than that. But this particular workshop, uh, I've been doing a, a monthly workshop for trial lawyers when I was still living in America. This will just be a day-long personal growth workshop for the trial lawyers that have been part of our groups in the past, as well as any in that area who want to come, and mental health professionals, because the trial lawyer who's going to be hosting the workshop at his home is in relationship with a mental health professional and they both wanted to come to the workshop. Great. Well, and just to make some terms really obvious, a lawyer in America is a barrister in other English speaking countries or sometimes called an attorney and or a, in, solicitor. Or a solicitor. Thank you. And in our country, a trial lawyer means a defense attorney, someone who is taking a client on who has been traumatized, victimized or accused and needs to be defended in a particular kind of a trial. Maybe someone is suing them or they're suing someone else. Maybe they've been involved in some kind of a dispute or an actual crime. Maybe they are accused of committing it or they've been victimized, one or the other, right? And so there's a lot of emotion that runs high in a lot of these trials. And I think it's amazing that you've got the opportunity to do this. And I can only imagine how much better these lawyers are going to be after having had your trainings and applying that to their work, not only with their clients, but also with their witnesses mm -hmm. and with their jury selection, right. right? Exactly. So that's great. All right, so here's my question. You're only going to get five minutes now okay. instead of ten because we have to move things along here and end on time. This is called Changes, Conversations Between Authors, because I like to ask people a lot of things about how things in their life are moving and changing, but also to ask your opinions about how things are in your personal world or in the wider world. So given all the local, personal, regional or provincial, statewide or national, global, spiritual or religious, scientific or technological, environmental or climatic, artistic, or any other kinds of changes you're aware of, which ones arouse in you hope, which ones arouse in you fear, or whatever of this do you want to talk about right now. Take it away, Mario Casa. Well, I would say that one of the things that arises in the hope uh, in the greatest way is that for decades, science and philosophy were pulling away from each other. And now, uh, in the, the past several decades, um, they seem to be coming back together again. And even the quantum physicists are realizing that what they know about physics is not so different from what the philosophers are talking about. So it seems to me that the, the world is starting to, in some ways I see that as a, a right brain, left brain integration, uh, you know, the, the balance of yin and yang and whatever, that, that seems to be happening for me, uh, for, happening in the world. Uh, and certainly that's Living in an Asian culture, I'm more exposed to that, I think. Than, and also, I don't watch the news, so and I don't read newspapers. So uh, I <laughs> don't have to uh, be confronted by things that contradict that point of view. <laughs> 
And uh, what arouses in me fear? Nothing. I choose not to live in fear. I'm reminded of everything is about musical theater in the final analysis. And <laughs> in the show Rent, there's that wonderful uh, moment in the, the group therapy scene where the therapist says, why choose fear? And the guy says, I'm a New Yorker. Fear's my life. You know, and... Uh, and where did you grow up? In New York. <laughs> but the, the song that it leads into has the refrain, give in to love or you will live in fear. And so I see more and more in the world that we're giving in to love. And that Wow. That does bring a lot of hope. That makes me a little teary right there. <laughs> see, he gets me to tears in a million ways. All right. So is there anything else you'd like people to know about your writing, your work, your action methods, your locations, anything you want them to remind themselves to check on or attend? Um, well, let's see. I certainly invite people to go to the, the website, which is a work in progress, and to click on the page that says Motivational Arts Unlimited, because we're going to be really developing, in addition to the work that we're going to be doing with the Indonesians, in order to help fund this, I'm going to be doing a number of programs for uh, expats and Tamus, which is the Indonesian word for guest. Uh, they don't have a word for tourist, but people who come to visit in the country are called guests, Tamus. It's a, um, a much gentler word. And some of the, the three classes that I'm planning to offer for guests, one is called musical theater dancing for fun and fitness. That will include a little tap, a little soft shoe, some Busby Berkeley, uh, just a fun time doing that. Another is called Reflective Theater, which is something that I developed with my friend Kea in uh, Melbourne years ago, a combination of playback theater, which was developed by Jonathan Fox, uh, who was a psychodramatist who brought a lot of elements of psychodrama into improvisational theater. And I've combined what little I know of of playback theater with audience interactive improvisational theater that was developed uh, with you, Sally, and with the others that we worked with in acting out. And Viola Spolin. And Viola Spolin, who studied with J.L. Moreno. Of course she of did. Of course she did. <laughs> uh, and I call it reflective theater. So I'm hoping to develop a reflective theater company in Bali. And then I'm also going to be doing a personal growth psychodrama group for um, expats and tumblers in, in Bali. And these will, will start with a, um, a taster session in either December or January. That will be free and people can come see what it's about. So check the website if you happen to live in Bali or, or if you're thinking of moving to Bali or visiting in Bali, check the website to see what's happening. So these experiences are going to be a one-off, which is what you call a taster. Mm -hmm. And then if people like it, they can look to see your schedule and there'll be a series of like classes or meetings. Right. Yes. And that'll be over the course of several months. Yes. Okay. Like two hours at a time or something like that. I wish I were there. I would participate. Well, maybe not the tap, but the other ones. <laughs> Although I did learn to tap in one of your plays for Many a five-minute yes. period of time that I had to do about four different kinds of steps, I think. <laughs> Very simple. Okay. So I am so excited that you came here to St. Louis to visit me. It was my birthday last week. That's not relevant, really, but it kind of is. And as you know, Mario and I are friends from 1978. And that means he's a lot older than I am, obviously. See? No. Yes, I am. Only a little bit. <laughs> and um, we have been friends. We have been colleagues. He has worked in an organization that I worked for. I've worked directly for you. And I just find that our relationship is one of the most valuable parts of my life. And I love you to pieces, and I thank you so much for everything you do for people and what you've done for me and for my son, Merlin, and lots of other young people. I just can never thank you enough, ever. And I've been really privileged to know you and to work with you and to write and edit with you and to learn from you. And yesterday was Thank a Mentor Day, or maybe it's today, I can't remember. 
but you have definitely been one of my major mentors, and thank you. Sama sama, as we say in Indonesia. Which means you're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> it means you're welcome. <laughs> Okay. And for those of you who would like to know, Changes Conversations Between Authors happens most Wednesdays, 10 o'clock Eastern Time, whether it's daylight or regular, in the USA. And it's for an hour. And I usually sit and have a conversation with authors who are on the other side of the world or the other side of the country in their own little room. And so it's not like this. This is a unique opportunity to have the person right here next to me. So thank you for making that happen. And next week, I'm going to have R.L. Andrew all the way from Down Under, from Australia. And then the week after that, which will be, well, first of all, September 9th is R.L. Andrew, Robin Andrew. And then the week after that is Bocara Brumley, right here from Texas in the United States. And the last week in September is open, and so are lots of other weeks in the fall. So if you are an author or you know someone who is an author of any kind, playwriting, poetry, screenwriting, nonfiction, any kind of fiction, blogging, and you would like to come on the show, please go to my website, sallyember.com, S-A-L-L-Y-E-M-B-E-R.com, right there under my name, and go to the changes page and read it and follow directions. I give points for people who follow directions. And thank you very much for everybody who listens today and has participated, and everybody else who's listening later, and you want to write comments or send us messages on the YouTube page, or this Google Plus event page, please do that. Or go right to Mario's site or right to my site and comment away. We would love to have your input, your insight, your questions. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to you. Do you want to say any more goodbyes? And as I say to everyone at the end, go well with your changes. Bye-bye.